Okay. Um, we're continuing in the studies in Exodus, and we've been working our way through, and we're coming up to the uh, the covenant at Sinai. And we, we started in that 19th chapter, and we observed how the Lord now is telling Moses to speak to the, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, that he was going to give some words, and if they would keep them, they could be a peculiar treasure to him. And this is the covenant he's going to give. Now, tonight we come to the 20th chapter, and why don't we read uh, through this chapter and then comment on this chapter. This is uh, one of the great chapters in the Bible in that I think many people are familiar with the contents of this chapter. I think it may be the contents of this particular chapter may be as well known as any chapter in the Bible. So we come to uh, the 20th chapter of Exodus and we read in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But in the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus, shalt, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, Thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. And so ends the 20th chapter of Exodus. In this particular chapter, what we have recorded for us in the first 17 verses are what is commonly known as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. So we label Exodus 20 the Ten Commandments. Because the meat of the chapter is going to be something that's pretty much known throughout the world. Now, this chapter is repeated for us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the law of Moses. Deutero means two, nomi means law. It's the second giving of the law. In Deuteronomy, chapter 5, you see this, these ten commandments repeated, all of them. In other words, the Lord goes, verily, verily. Uh, don't miss it. The, the Lord understands repetition is important for us because we're slow at getting things. And uh, repetition is, is the mother of learning for us. So he repeats it. Now I've, I've uh, 
dealt with a, a number of people uh, on the word of the Lord, and I had uh, one a skeptic uh, uh, from China uh, dealing with me years ago at a hospital saying, oh, Ten Commandments, there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Well, well, we just read them right here, and of course, uh, w you can read them again in Deuteronomy 5 for your homework. He says, yeah, I know there's all those commandments there, but it doesn't say there's Ten Commandments. People just numbered them on their own. Well, actually, um, if we continue on to Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34, and um, we're reading a kind of a, a recollection of, of things that had happened. This is much later, a little bit later, months later or whatever. And uh, we read in verse 28, speaking about verse 27, so you know who we're talking about. We're talking about the Lord and Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I've made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there, Moses was there with the Lord, forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> okay, so the scripture will confirm that there are Ten Commandments. By the way, that's repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 4. You'll see it said again, the Ten Commandments. So when some uh, gainsayer or naysayer or mocker or scoffer comes along and says, oh yeah, there's no Ten Commandments, they just numbered them. Well, you just uh, write those verses along next to the 20th chapter in your Bible, which would be Exodus 34, 28 or Deuteronomy 10, 4 over and out, 10-4 uh, over and out. They might remember that easily. And uh, you can take them there and you can see the phrase, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are given in the Mosaic Covenant. Now, it begins with, and God spake. Amen. Now, curious, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful it's God speaking. And I think that's wonderful. He's the creator of heaven and earth. But I observe that through so much of, of the chapters here that we've been reading in Exodus, as God was speaking to Moses, he would refer to himself as the Lord. The Lord. The Lord. And we, we took a look at the difference between how the Bible looks at God, and God is the Creator. But we look at when you get to the term Lord, Lord is the Relator. He's the one that relates to us. We, we uh, confess with our mouths in the book of Romans, the Lord Jesus. We enter into a relationship, a lordship relationship with Jesus. He is Lord, we as servants. And it's curious that he begins this chapter and says, and say, and the Lord spake all these things. He says, God spake all these things. And as you look at these Ten Commandments, you're going to find that this is a moral law that the Creator God is setting forth within the Mosaic Covenant, but it extends beyond it to such a point that all Gentiles seem to know these Ten Commandments. Because this is part of the moral spiritual law that God has set for His universe. So God the Creator, in creating His universe, has set up a moral system of laws, like He's got natural laws, and they're inviolate. That means you don't violate them. Or, or if you do, there's a consequence. One of these Ten Commandments will be specifically made with the nation of Israel in honoring the Sabbath. And you see that in other books of the Bible, that this was something specifically made with Israel. So much so that when you get to the New Testament, all nine commandments will be repeated in the New Testament except the Sabbath one. Because the Sabbath one was specific for Israel. But the other nine were part of the Creator God speaking and saying, you know, this is part of my, this is my moral law for my universe. God is speaking here. Not just the Lord to people he's in relationship, but God the Creator saying, this is going to hold throughout my universe. These are moral commandments in my universe. We're going to find, and I'll point it out as we move along in our studies, that there will be three aspects to the law given to Israel. Okay, There will be the moral law, 
which we're looking at tonight, and that's chapter 20. There will be the civil law, and we will look at that in the next few weeks in chapters 21 through 23. And there will be the ceremonial law. And this will be the book of Leviticus. And little bits will be smattered in to our readings in Exodus. But predominantly it will be Leviticus. And so the way it works is that the, um, the scribes spent most of their time dealing with the moral law. The priests spent their time dealing with the ceremonial law. And the elders of the nation of Israel, the judges and the like, the mighty men and the chiefs of nation, they had to deal with the civil, the civil law. We're going to see that these ordinances of the civil law and the ceremonial law will be done away in Christ. But the moral law will not be done away in Christ. As a matter of fact, after we receive Christ, we are now expected to keep the moral law, which we were never able to keep in our natural man. So we'll see this as we go along in our studies. I just pointed out for you tonight quickly by way of introduction as we begin studying Exodus chapter 20. All right, let's look at these commandments. Let's break them down. Let's number them as we go through. And God spake all these words. First off, you have to understand God is speaking. And God spake all these words. He didn't speak ideas. He didn't speak notions. He didn't speak concepts or thoughts or messages. He spake in words. All right? He's not like a Hollywood, you know, producer. I got a notion. But if we get a little money, we can turn it into a concept. And with a few more people, we'll make that an idea. And then we can get a script. And, and No, I mean, this is God, and He is the Word, and He speaks words. I wish Christians would get that. <laughs> they seem to think He has ideas, and we can use dynamic equivalents and say what we want. God speaks words. Amen, Amen. Brother Mike. Amen. 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 Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's how He speaks. Words. Particular words. He knows exactly what he wants to say. He says exactly what he means, and he means what he says. Isn't that nice as a Christian? Mm -hmm. You know what's so nice about that? You don't have to go running hither, thither, and yon to find out what God said. I wonder what the scholar thinks. What do you think God meant? And here's what he said. He spake all these words. You want to know what he meant? Ask him. Get on your knees, open the book, and say, I'm reading these words. Lord, this is what I do. This is how I do my Bible study. I don't want a mediator. I want the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to guide me into truth. My mediator will be Jesus. And I say, you spake these words. Help me to understand them. Don't help me to rewrite them or change them or alter them. Please don't help me to ignore them. Help me to understand them and keep them. And God spake all these words. And here's how he starts. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Frequently, the first commandment will be taught as being commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I find that to be commandment one, part B. What I find is part A is, I am the Lord thy God. 1A. 1B, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's amazing how the human heart, even the good Christian, good godly Christian scholarly human heart, leaves God out of the Ten Commandments. And good godly Christianettes and will have sermonettes and, and have little vignettes and signets that you can put up that will have the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Before whom? It's, I am the Lord thy God. This commandment, this first commandment is a, is a wonderful commandment. If we could get our eyes focused on part A of that first commandment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am the Lord thy God. If we could lift our eyes up to the heavenly glory and look at the Lord thy God, I'll bet if we really looked at him and desired him and thirsted <laughs> after him and, and wanted to know him, I'll bet we, we wouldn't have trouble keeping the other uh, nine and a half commandments. Because as you draw nigh unto God and he draws nigh unto you, 
His holiness is imparted unto you. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. What he means is, when you get close to me, you'll be holy because I'm holy. It'll rub off on you. You don't have any holiness of your own. I am the Lord thy God. He starts right off the bat. I'm always amazed at how that's ignored. People will say the Ten Commandments start with verse 3. No, they start with verse 2. I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God. Amen. Is there about a relationship with the Lord thy God? Is that what we're trying to achieve here? Amen. I am the Lord thy God. And by the way, I brought thee out of, bound, uh, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I don't think there's anyone around that relates to the Lord thy God who hasn't been brought out of the house of bondage. Amen. I watched a guy on television yesterday sit there with a black top and a white collar. He's an Episcopalian guy, teaches at Harvard Divinity School, who, who knows nothing of God, but he's interviewed on national television because he hates God. And he's liberal in his interpretation. He says, you know, I, uh, I don't think anybody can speak for God. Even God can't speak for God. I don't even believe God is a person. I believe he's a power. He's a force. He's the source of good. In the, and he has no relationship to the Lord thy God. And, and the Lord isn't his God. And he didn't refer to him as the Lord. He talked to him about as God, the creator, somewhere in a distance. Bette Midler and, uh, and uh, the other one, uh, what's her name, that was, I am God, I'm a, this, what's her name? Mm-hmm. Shirley MacLaine and him would get together on the beach and walk and talk about a God far off. I look at the God inside of each one of us, he said to the interviewer yesterday. He hasn't been brought out of the house of bondage. Mm-hmm. That man hasn't been delivered from himself, Egypt, from his flesh. But those of us who have, he is the Lord thy God. He's the relator. He relates to you. And that's the God you worship. And remember he brought you out of bondage. Remember the great salvation that he's given to you. I don't know how long ago. Some of you might be over 20 years ago. But think back on it. And remember that great salvation. And think on him. And if you just remember commandment 1A, it'll be easy to follow the other nine and a half because you'll have his help. But you forget that 1A, and we skip down to 1B. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, in the particular time this was written, 1490-something B.C., the earth had been around, man had been on the earth for about 2,500 plus years. And there was a lot of idolatry. Matter of fact, turn to Romans chapter 1. So we're going back 1490 something BC. Today we're in 2000 plus AD. So we're going back 3000, almost 3500 years we're going back. We're going back to a uh, time long ago in a place far away over there outside of Palestine and Sinai. And those people there had come from a man and his family that had come off a boat by the name of Noah. And that man, Noah, had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that man knew God. And that man was saved by God through an ark. And his children knew God. And from those three boys came these folks in Sinai and all the other people that populated the earth. They all had a knowledge of God. They knew about the flood. And here's what happened to them. Uh, Romans 1. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made That's us too. We're made things. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, when they got off that boat, after that year of flooding and destruction, and those eight people emerged from that boat and God put a rainbow in the sky and they offered an offering up to him 
And God said, I will never destroy the earth by flood again. Now go forth, be fruitful and multiply. They told their kids, and their kids told their kids, and their kids told their kids, and there was no doubt there was a God. They knew God. But time passes. Time passes, and a few centuries go on, and we get to where we are now, and here's what we are. Be because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And these people, these Jewish people, had come out of a nation called Egypt, where they bowed down to all kinds of idols. And they had gods in their hearts that they had set up instead of God, the creator God of the Bible. And they were without excuse. And yet they had the griffin, and they had the lion with the wings, and they had the calf, the golden calf, and they worshipped the insects, and they worshipped all types of things in Egypt. And if you get it, go to your libraries, pull out textbooks, pull out history books, and see see carved graven images of gods they worshipped and read their mythology about Isis and Osiris and Ra and all the very and Ptah and all the gods that they had in Egypt without excuse changing the glory of God into corruptible images and they had gods in their hearts and so God is giving this commandment to his people saying, you've come out of idolatry like that. I've delivered you from that, that land of Egypt. You've seen that all around you. These people have gods in their hearts. Before they made an idol, there was something wrong with their heart. That's why the sec the, that, that commandment is thou shalt not, it doesn't say verse 3, thou shalt have no other idols before me. It says thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because a god is something that you set up in your heart. The next commandment will deal with idolatry, but it begins in the heart before it gets to the hand. And they had gods in their hearts. They didn't want to accept the fact that the Creator God had done the work that He had done. So they said, you know, maybe there is a, there's a power out there that controls the movement of the stars. And maybe the stars follow a particular pattern based on a certain month. And so there's, there's a, a Libra sign, and there's a Taurus sign, and oh, this is how it's all happening. There's a powerful force that's an orderly working force out there, like a great clock and watch that works in the sky. And they set these ideas up, professing themselves to be wise. Do you ever observe the pattern of the stars? I've been observing that at the solstice, there's always a certain pattern up there. They became fools. And they set up gods inside them. Today, how do we do that? Well, I don't know how many of us are into astrology today. Although I think they pr print it in every newspaper, don't they? Don't they have the horoscope in every newspaper? Imagine. Still people running around with following astrology? Can you imagine 20th century man, just like an Egyptian? What other gods might there be? Well, well, we're not looking at idols here. We're looking at gods. We're looking at things in your mind, things in your heart. That's where the problem begins. When you won't abide in the truth, when your heart will not abide in the truth and accept God for who He is, then you set up gods on the inside. Gods can be other persons. As a matter of fact, uh, God even said to Moses at one point earlier in the book, you remember, He says, uh, I've made thee a god unto Pharaoh. Why? Because a god was someone that was bringing a higher message to him. Sometimes we look to people as gods. Maybe, maybe a uh, a high pope, or a cardinal, or, or, a, or a woman that gives her whole life to working in India. Wow, that's amazing. I want to be just like that. And your heart starts drifting in that direction. Maybe a saint that you've read about, and your heart goes in that direction. And there are gods as you, you, you start turning away. Maybe a great enlightened teacher, like a Maharashi. Wow, what great teachings he has. He's like a God with the high knowledge that he has. Isn't this amazing? Okay, maybe you're not spiritual at all. Maybe you're practical in business. And this guy says, you know, I have a way to make your business successful. And he's bought and sold businesses and made hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow, I want to be like that guy. And your heart turns toward that. Maybe in the science field. 
In my field, I see that. You know, I'm just a mediocre doctor. I work with mediocre doctors. There are great doctors who have great gifts. And I remember I was at a conference not too long ago and a bunch of mediocre doctors sitting under a, a more mediocre doctor teaching us. But the more mediocre doctor was saying, you know, I was once in the presence of Dr. So-and-so. And I told my students, remember, we are not worthy to be in his presence. And, and there's no doubt that this doctor you're speaking about was a great man who had done a lot of wonderful things. God had given and imparted great wisdom and gifts unto this man. And there are men like that. Unfortunately, there are lesser men that set them up as gods. I want to be just like that. I want to do research 24 hours a day so I can be just like that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Sometimes the God isn't a person or it's not a way of work, but it's a philosophy. And you devote all your time to a particular philosophy. I want to make the world a better place. I want to clean up the environment. I want to save the spotted whale. Or I want to nuke the spotted whale. I've seen all kinds of crazy things. But people set up ideas on the inside in their hearts and in their minds. And you're setting up gods. And God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Whether it's a person, a philosophy, whether it's a workplace, a procedure, a setting up gods, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. What, what happens with something? Turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and shall set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, and let them show unto them. He's saying, I can prophesy, I can tell you the, the end from the beginning. Verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time? Have I declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. I mean, it's just so plain and clear. I think we all knew it as children. I think, I, I, I think there was not a one of us as a little child that did not just have an inherent understanding inside of us there is a God. The God of the universe, the creator God the Almighty, there's no other God beside Him. And how our deceptive hearts drift with time and with the vain philosophies and imaginations of others and we find ourselves setting up gods in our heart and the first commandment is, I am the Lord thy God. <laughs> is there a God beside me? I know no God. I know not any. He ought to know. He knows the whole universe. There isn't any other. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first thing he's saying is, keep your heart focused in the right direction. That's the first commandment. Keep your heart focused on God. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is there anything you want to put in your heart above or before God? Well, the Lord says, if I've redeemed you and I've brought you out of the house of bondage, I command that the answer be no. <laughs> you know, these are the Ten Commandments we saw, right? Was it said that in Exodus 34? Deuteronomy 10.4? The Ten Commandments. They're not the Ten Suggestions. Now, I understand that, that uh, lost people may not appreciate them, may not read them, <laughs> in their ignorance may break them. But those of us who've been brought from the house of bondage, these are commandments for us. They're good commandments. We're going to find they're healthy commandments. They have our best interest at heart. After all, He's the Lord our God. That's the first commandment, verses 2 and 3. Now, the second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, is like an outflowing, an outworking of what happens if the first commandment starts to go awry. The second commandment is, thou shalt, uh, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image 
or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. A graven is to engrave something. It's often spoken of with, um, with metals. And here's what happens. Here is the history of mankind, kind of in a nutshell. What happens is, after their heart departed from the true and the living God, then, then nature abhors a vacuum, and there's an empty space in their heart. And once the true and living God has left that space in the heart that's meant for him, other gods fill the void. And once those other gods get in the heart, then a person will begin to work with his hands that which is in his heart. And so you'll find in the history of mankind, whether it be Babylon, whether it be Assyria, whether it be the Hittites, whether it be up there around Tyre and Sidon and the Phoenicians, whether it be the Egyptians where they just came out of, no matter where it be, you will eventually find graven images of that which was in those people's hearts. And the Lord says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, now, he wants to expand upon this very carefully because we might think, well, you mean I shouldn't make any graven image of anything I've set up in my heart above you, especially like a four-footed beast. I mean, I'm not going to make a griffin, okay? I'm not going to make a calf, and I'm not going to make a flying eagle or something like this, but, but I could try and make something to represent you, God, couldn't I? Because you're in heaven. And he says right here, thou shalt not make, verse 4, any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Why? Why, why can't I make something that's like in heaven above? I mean, after all, I read in the Bible about angels. Angels are good things. Can't I make a nice graven image of an angel from heaven? A holy angel like Michael the Archangel. Wouldn't that be neat? And I could have a church with a nice graven Michael the Archangel as people come through the door and they go, wow, who's that? That's Michael the Archangel. Whoa. Wow, this is a holy place. Let's take our shoes off. We're on holy ground. But the Lord's very clear about this. Not even heaven. Why? Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him, not angels, in spirit and truth. Not in heaven above or that is in the earth. Well, what about a great man like Moses? Moses. Moses went up in the mount. We were afraid to talk to God, but Moses went right up into the cloud. Moses got all those words and delivered them to us. He was a fine man. He was a good man. He was the best. He's Moses. And, and, and he's not a bad looking guy. He's got a nice profile. He's got a straight nose. We could, make, we could make a statue of Moses and put it up there because people may forget what a great man Moses was. Nor of anything that's in the earth. I don't want a statue of a man. What about Jesus? Now there's a man. God, you've got to love Jesus. That's your son. And now, now we could make a nice statue of Jesus. I've seen some of the pictures painted of him. Now, I don't know if I could get the red hair on the statue, but I could, I could get that long flowing hair and that, that robe, you know, and that real, I could even have him maybe picking up a couple of kids, you know, how much he loves them, giving them a blessing, or, or maybe uh, having a little dove on his finger, or, or him getting baptized. And the Lord says, no, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Amen. Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But he's not done with this commandment. This is a long commandment. As I read, it's, it's four. Verse four, long verse. Verse five, long verse. Verse six, long verse. Verse seven, it's a long verse. It's four long verses. Four is the number of the earth and the world. And idolatry and graven images are found all over the earth and all over the world at the four corners of the earth. I don't care where you go. You can go to the most remotest part of Australia, to the little aborigine, over to South America or Africa or way up in Alaska, and you'll find all kinds of strange carved poles. Idolatry is all over the earth. What does God think about this? He says, thou shalt not. 
in verse 4. Don't even make it. That's one part. How about 5? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So, well, I made this graven image, you know, and, and I don't want you to be too mad at me for making it because I'm just going to put it there as an aid to worship. And, 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 but well, well, yeah, it is true that there's a candle next to it and I get down on my knees and light the candle, but I'm not bowing down to it, you know, you understand. I mean, in the technical sense. I mean, I'm sure if you videotape me, it would look that way, but you've got to understand, God. I mean, this is really helping me get closer to you. Don't make it, don't bow down to it. Nor serve it. You know what we need at the church? We need a nice statue. So we're going to have a drive. We're all going to go out and work and serve so we can get a nice statue. Don't serve that. I've heard that stuff. People that want to work to get a statue at their church. That's service to get a statue. That's serving a graven image. Don't do that. Why is that, Lord? Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Why? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. God is jealous? Jealous is a bad word. Doesn't he know that? No, no, you're, you're confusing jealous with envy. Jealous is a good word. Envy is a bad word. Envy is, is uh, getting upset over someone that has something you want. God is not envious at all. Jealous is getting upset over someone taking something that's already yours. And God is jealous because I've redeemed you. I've purchased you from the house of bondage. You're mine. You're my peculiar treasure. And when something starts stealing you away from me, I'm jealous. I am a jealous God. That's one of his names in the Bible. His name is Jealous. And so God doesn't like that. He's a jealous God because God's love, he wants his love to be reciprocated and brought back. He gives the love to you. He wants to have it come back. He's looking at you. He wants you to look back at him, not have your heart turn and then your eyes turn and go in a different direction and start bowing down to something else. He's a jealous God. And notice what he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now watch it. You're an idolater? Do you have an image? People that make images hate God. That's what God just said. God just said it. You make an image? You, don't, you bound down to an image? You have a carved image? Then you hate God. He, he said it. Read it again. Read it carefully. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I thy God, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The iniquity of idolatry means you hate God. Iniquity, is that bad? That's the worst kind of sin in the Bible. Transgression, Sin, iniquity, that's as deep and as rotten as it gets in God's book. You want to talk about original sin? Go back to, go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Original sin didn't start with man. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14, verse 12. For thou hast said in thine heart. It's a heart problem. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That was the original sin of the heart, in the heart, during the fall of Lucifer. It was a heart issue. And then God describes that fall 
in Ezekiel chapter 28, and he says it like this, talking about all the heart, in thy heart, I will, I will, I will, I'll be like God. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, that's Lucifer. I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. What was Lucifer's iniquity? He wanted to take God's place. What's idolatry about? Making an image to take God's place. That's the sin of Lucifer in your heart. God says, you do that, you hate me. You hate me like Lucifer hates me. You hate me like Satan hates me. The second commandment is a warning against idolatry and graven images. And if you make an image, God says, you hate me. And if you hate me, it's going to affect your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids to the third and fourth generation. That sin will get knit inside of your fabric and will get carried over into them. Because they'll grow up with idolatry and they'll get steeped in idolatry and they'll say, I was born a blank and I'll die a blank. And it was good enough for my father and my grandfather and it's good enough for me. And God says, you hate me. Your grandfather hated me and you hate me. Now, curious thing. I hold in my hand a book signed by Pope John Paul II. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church, Liberia Editress Vaticana, the Vatican Library. This is prepared following the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, John Paul Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God for Everlasting Memory, with his signature right here, Johannes Paulus II, uh, given October 11, 1992, the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council in the 14th year of my pontificate. I'm going to read from here. They will not be my opinions or my thoughts. We'll read. This is the chapters in the back starting on page 505 on the Articles of the Ten Commandments. Article number one, the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, brought you out of Egypt. You shall not make for yourself. He says, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's commandment number one. I am the Lord thy God, brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's good. I think that's good. That's the first commandment. Commandment number two. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, I was just reading the Bible here. And commandment number two is thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt now bow on thyself to them, nor serve them. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. That's the second commandment. The third commandment, as you skip down, is in verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Commandment number 2. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Commandment number 3 is commandment 4 in your Bible. Commandment number, and it goes on down, all the way down the line, until commandment number nine. Let me find it for you. Page 405 we started. You just got to get it. Commandment number nine is page 601 here. Turn in your Bibles, Exodus. If you count down, commandment number nine is verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Commandment number 10 is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant. That's Bible. Commandment number 9 here, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. 
Commandment number 10, page 606. You shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. So what did they do? They removed commandment number 2. They moved up commandments number 3 through 10 and placed them in positions 2 through 9. And when they had an empty commandment, they took the 10th one and split it in half. Put half as uh, commandment 9 and half as commandment 10. This was started in 400 AD by a man named Augustine, the first one to float this idea. Augustine liked statues. So he wasn't going to let that commandment stand in the way of him having statues. Why? Because he hated God in his heart. That's what God says. You set up an idol, you hate, you hate me in your heart. An image maker hates God in his heart. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Augustine did this in 400 AD. John 4 had been written. Jesus had said it to the woman of the well. God is a spirit. There was no excuse for what he did. It's a curious thing because that's the catechism of the Catholic Church. You say, well, you know, you Baptists have your own Bible. First off, I'm not a Baptist. I'm a born-again Christian. Okay. Jesus said you must be born again. He didn't say you must be Baptist. If he said you must be Baptist, I'd be a Baptist. He said, you must be born again. I'm a born again Christian. Secondarily, where the word of a king is, there's power. I read the Holy Bible, the King James Bible. That's the one God's given us. But we have our own Bible, a Catholic Bible. Well, this is the Catholic Bible. This is the Immaculate Conception edition of the Catholic Bible here. My fingers don't work all that well, but we'll get to it eventually. Holy Bible with the confraternity text. Uh, published with the approbation of His Excellency John Carey, Bishop of Lafayette. There's a picture of the Pope up there, St. Peter's in the Vatican. This is a Catholic Bible. Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus, chapter 20. Highlight the Ten Commandments, that's what it's called. Then God delivered all these commandments. Verse 2, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods beside me. Verse number four. You got your Bible in front of you? Verse number four is the second commandment. The one that's missing in their catechism. Here's the Catholic Bible. Exodus 20, verse four. You shall not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, inflicting punishment for the father's wickedness on the children of those that hate me down to the third and fourth generation. It's in their Bible. But it's not in the catechism they teach. Why is that? They don't read their Bible. They don't encourage you to read the Bible. If you're a Catholic and you read your own Catholic Bible, you'll find out the second commandment is against idolatry and graven images. But since we don't read this Bible, we just teach a catechism, and since we have a church full of statues and graven images and carved images, don't read that Bible. Just go to CCD and learn the Catechism. Well, today you've heard the Bible. So God's given you a heart. He's given you a mind and a brain. You think it about it. You work it out. Second commandment. Stated plainly in the Scriptures. This commandment, this idolatry, the result of idolatry, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 17. Isaiah 42, verse 17. When the time comes to stand before God, is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, they shall be turned back, they shall be greatly ashamed, that trust in graven images, that say unto the molten images, Ye are our gods. I lost something. I prayed to Saint so and so. I got down and lit a candle to Saint so and so. I was having problems at work, and I lit a candle to Saint so and so. Someone's pregnant will pray to Saint so and so. The Lord says, You'll be greatly ashamed in the day you meet him. The second commandment no carved images. Thou shalt not set up any idols. God says that's a form of hatred, a form of hatred. He finishes the commandment by saying this 
in the 20th chapter. Those that hate me in verse 5, but what do I do? And I show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You know what happens? So many of us were in idolatry at one time in our life. But we turned in our hearts. We repented toward God. Placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He showed us mercy. He showed us mercy. And we have an opportunity to tell our children and their children tell their children. And God will show that mercy to thousands of generations. But we have to turn from idolatry. That's what the Lord wants. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. You know how you, you ever pray? How do you pray? You close your eyes. You know why? You shut out all images. You shut out all pictures. You shut out the world. And your spirit communes with God's spirit. A person that needs a picture or a statue on the outside has lost God on the inside. It's an inner relationship. Spirit to spirit, you must be born of the spirit. We looked at the first two commandments. Um, any questions on what we looked at? We'll continue next week on the rest of the commandments. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the word of the Lord. Thank you for the pure word of the Lord. And thank you for other facsimile Bibles that still retain enough of a reading of the word of the Lord that if anyone would turn to you in spirit and in truth, you would show mercy unto them as you've shown to thousands of other generations. Lord, please help us to turn from idols to the living God and place our faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image and the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.